Welcome everyone. I hope you've been enjoying the second full day of our Peace Studio Summit. If you've been with us for other programs earlier in the day, I'd encourage you to type a few comments into the Zoom chat window as people settle in. What stood out to you in your summit experience so far? And please feel free to continue using that chat function to engage throughout today's event. We have another wonderful program in store for you this afternoon. I am so thrilled to share the virtual stage with two extraordinary writers, Anjali and Jetty and Jimin Han. Not only do we get to hear them read brief excerpts of their novels, we'll also be hearing from them about how fiction can sometimes be the best way to communicate important and challenging ideas and opinions, and how they've been able to find success with that approach. Anjali, we're going to start with you. Could you tell us briefly about your debut novel, The Parted Earth, and offer some context on the passage you'll be reading? Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for having me. The Parted Earth takes place over 70 years and in multiple continents and countries. It's the story about the 1947 partition of the subcontinent. Um, 1947 was the year that the British finally quit what was then called India. India then wasn't a nation state. Uh, it was a, a region, a, a land with many kingdoms in it. Um, but before the British quit India in 1947, they drew a line literally in the sand, dividing the subcontinent into two new nations, the Muslim majority of Pakistan, which consisted of West Pakistan and East Pakistan, and the Hindu and Sikh majority nation of India. And in my novel, The Parted Earth, I start out the book in 1947 uh, with a 16 year old character named Deepa, uh, who is seeing where she's living in Delhi, sort of the chaos erupt around her. Uh, partition resulted in uh, 15 million people becoming refugees overnight, fleeing to their new country. Um, and one to two million people uh, perished. And so Deepa is noticing this. Um, but the novel also tells the story about Deepa's estranged granddaughter. Her name is Sean, which is short for Shanti, and she lives uh, in the Atlanta area in the present day. Uh, Sean is in her early 40s in most of the novel. Um, but the excerpt I'm going to read for you today is the one part of the book that takes place in Sean's youth. It's when she's 10 years old. Um, she is in India for the very first time with her father, father Vijay. Uh, Vijay uh, abandoned her and her mother when Sean was only five years old. She's hardly seen him. And Sean uh, is being raised primarily by her white mother. So not only um, is she sort of uh, not sure about this relationship she has with her dad, but she is also not very closely connected to her Indian heritage. So the excerpt I'm gonna read now, uh, Sean is 10 years old and with her father Vijay, and he has brought her to India for the first time and they are in Agra to see the Taj Mahal. They followed streams of tourists down the walkway, their shadows elongated, conjoined. When he squeezed her hand, she felt a tremble in his fingers. I've really missed you, Shanti, he said. She hadn't heard her birth name in a long time, even on the plane ride over during their one night stopover in London, their connection to Delhi, he'd addressed her by her nickname, Sean. She'd adopted it at the beginning of the first grade, not long after he left them. She wanted something easier to pronounce, something that other kids wouldn't make fun of that sounded more in tune with her last name, her mother's name, Johnson. Sean could be short for Shauna. No one needed to know the truth. But she liked how her father said Shanti right now, how it rolled off his tongue, how the TH sound became something harder, sharper, something so different than the way her mother used to say it. I missed you too, daddy. It slipped out by accident, daddy. She couldn't remember ever calling him that, not even when, he was lit when she was little. He'd always been dad. Besides, she was almost 11 now, way too old to use daddy. She then broke free, dashed between tall, narrow bushes. Her new gold chains shimmied against her shirt's collar. At the lip of the pool, she knelt on her cotton pants, peered over the water. Her father lowered himself with a grunt. His hand dove beneath the surface, cupped, 
poured the water over his head. In his reflection, she spotted the matching depression in his chin, the similar squared angle of his jaw, the identical slight straight nose. She traced the image of his cheek with her thumb. She had not noticed before how much she resembled him. His skin tone, a deep brown, perfectly matched her own. Her mother's skin was a creamy white, like almost everyone's in Seattle. Sean had to claim or be claimed by her mother to prove their shared genes. Complete strangers would ask Sean, oh, are you adopted? They asked her mother, is she your stepdaughter? Here in India, Sean could see herself in her other parent, could match her skin to the skin of so many others around her. For the first time, she looked like everyone else, even though every Indian seemed to know she was an American. She removed her hand from the pool, flipped off the beads of water. Let's go, she said. I want to see it up close. Visitors spilled onto the terrace, pointed to the monument, flowed toward the main entrance. She and her father fell in line, inched forward until a surge carried them through a short, narrow doorway of the building. She envisioned rows of armor, shields belonging to knights, scepters made of gold, red plush carpet, portraits of royalty. Instead, it was pitch dark. Cool, shuffling feet echoed around her. She blinked her eyes, found herself in a single room with a vaulted ceiling. At its center, a marble lattice fence enclosed two long, narrow boxes. She wove her fingers through the grid, peered through the spaces. Here they are, her father said the Queen Mumtaz and the Shah Jahan. What do you mean? They're resting here together, he said, for all eternity. These are coffins? Her hand dropped. She stepped back. She pressed her face into her father's shirt, tried to shake the images of withering skin and bones from her mind. Shanti, are you okay? He raised her chin, narrowed his dark eyes, she saw in them the pain of disappointing her again, of falling short as a father. Can we please go back outside, she asked. He nodded. They worked their way quickly around the perimeter and exited where they entered. Let me show you something else, he said. He led her around the corner, pivoted her body, directed her gaze along the banks of a shallow river. See there? It's called Agra Fort. In the distance, red cylindrical towers kissed low-lying clouds, walls like decorative curtains strung them together. That's the palace where Emperor Shah Jahan ruled India, he said. When Mumtaz died, he built the Taj Mahal here so he could watch over her from Agra Fort. When he died, they entombed them here together. He paused. Isn't that a lovely thought? He never wanted to be away from his wife. The truth of his statement stung. The emperor had never wanted to be away from the queen, but her own father had gone as far away from her and her mother as he could. I never knew my father, he said. His gaze locked on hers. Did I ever tell you that? The words fell out of his mouth, landed with a thud between them. His father, her grandfather. She knew this, so how she came to know it escaped her. She always seemed to know about this absence in her father's life, much the same way she always knew of her own father's absence in hers. He had seemed oblivious to the fact that they shared this kind of sadness of missing fathers. She wanted to shake him in that moment. His decision to move to India without her had been a selfish one. He still did not see it as such. Five years into his relocation, was wholly unaware of how his absence continued to hurt her, how it made her feel so lonely. For her eighth birthday, he had mailed her a globe, the earth parted by latitudes and longitudes, oceans and continents. She had measured with her hands the distance between Seattle and India, nine hands. The sun never shone on them at the same time. He had moved so far away from her, he might as well have moved to the moon. When he lifted his face, his gaze traced the horizon, settled back on Agra Fort. Nothing makes me happier than having you here with me now, he said. No one has ever meant more to me than you. She smiled, the first of the day. If these rare moments were all they could ever have together, maybe it would be enough.
Thank you so much, Angela. You know, it's such a beautiful novel on the page. It's so beautifully crafted, but hearing you read it is just something else. So thank you for that. All right, Jimin, you already know how much I love and admire a small revolution, uh, but could you tell us a little bit more about your novel and the passage you're about to read? Sure, thank you so much for having me, Zhang. Um, so I'm Jimin and my pronouns are she, her, and I am thrilled to read from A Small Revolution today. Um, it's structured in segmented fiction, which means that I have these numbered sections and um, the whole novel takes place in a few hours in one day. Um, so it's set in 1985 on a college campus in Pennsylvania. Um, and it is told from the point of view of a freshman college student who is um, being held in this room. Um, I'm reading from the beginning, so I, I don't need to say much more than that, but it is 1985, it's in Pennsylvania, college dorm, and um, the main character, Yuna, uh, just spent the summer in Korea. And um, Korea, 1985, is a time um, of an intense pro-democracy movement. And um, so this is what she experienced when she was there. Okay. Okay. Um, and I would like to give a content warning at this time. Um, uh, so, okay, just to be a little bit, um, to be aware, there's a, um, there's a, a little bit of violence and there's, um, so, one, a woman is running in a field of fallen leaves and a man is running behind her. It's early enough in the morning for the sky to be gray and the trees to be black. Early enough for me to hear only the sound of her breathing and his breathing, except for that moment when he gains on her, makes contact and tackles her. And she lets out a high pitched sound cut short as she hits the ground. This is the view I have from my open dorm window into the quadrangle of Weston College in the middle of Pennsylvania. Two, you told me once about a neighbor who had a border collie named Pirate. One day you were outside early in the morning and saw two wild rabbits in your neighbor's yard, two small brown ones. And then you heard the back screen door slam and watched Pirate charge across the grass toward those rabbits. One took off for the bushes on the periphery and Pirate pursued it while the other stayed absolutely still, like a statue, so still you questioned your own eyes. Was it a sculpture of a rabbit in the neighbor's yard? Pirate trotted out of the bushes having given up the chase. He had never paid much attention to you before, but you walked toward the dog, calling him by name rewarding him with long petting strokes and backed away as slowly as you could, leading him away. When you looked up again, the statue was gone. Three, I remain at the dorm window. I stay, even when I see him stand her up and drag her stumbling by the back of her coat. He turns, retracing his steps, searching the ground, and then he picks up something he had dropped earlier. He hoists it up and begins to walk forward again, keeping his other hand on the woman's coat and yanking her along. I stay, even when I know he's coming for me, even when I can see clearly that it's your friend, Lloyd. I stay because the woman is someone I know well, and in his hand is a shotgun. Four, the screams in the hallway launch me toward the phone. I dial 911 and someone on the other end says, What's your emergency? I think I'm saying, come now, please. But a voice on the other end says, is someone there? I can't hear you. Can you tell me what's happening? Yuna, it's Dayu shrieking in the hall. I drop the phone and run and open it. There are mud splats on her face, her black hair a squash nest. Dayu Chu is a friend of mine from a dorm across campus. There are grass stains on the knees of her pink flannel pajamas. Her blue sweatshirt with the round Weston College logo is smeared with damp patches. Lloyd appears beside her. He's got a leer on his face and his hair is wet as if he's been caught in the rain. You know, he's crazy, Dayu sobs. I can't help but step back and he pushes her into the room. 
Dayu scrambles toward the wall by my bed, moving as far from him as she can get, hides her face in her hands. What? The only word I can say as Lloyd turns, still in the doorway, and raises a shotgun into the hall. More screams and people scatter, and I hear Heather's voice, Yuna, you okay? Heather Colony has a, has a room next to mine. Instead of fleeing, she's coming. Don't, I call out. But Lloyd grabs her by the sleeve of her terry cloth robe, and Heather reaches for, Ta for Faye Taverson to save herself as if she's falling off a pier. And Faye is caught off guard, and Heather and Faye are reeled into the room. Lloyd kicks the door closed, and someone pounds on it from the other side. A voice comes through calling for me. It's Joanna, the resident advisor. Go away, I'll kill them all, Lloyd explodes. He shoots the gun, his shoulder jerks back. And it's as if a grenade, as I imagine it, went off in the room. I crouch on the floor, my arms over my head. There's ringing in my ears. There's no more pounding on the door after that. I'm aware of Dayu wailing from the corner behind me and Faye huddled on the bed to my left saying, oh my God, oh my God, over and over again. and Heather telling everyone to be quiet from somewhere to my right. I've heard gunfire before, but something about this room, this space is louder than anything I've heard. The sirens when they come loop as if they're fading and then growing louder. Are they coming to rescue us or someone else? Stop, Lloyd shouts as if his words are coming out of a body that is itself a gun. Stop, stop, whatever you're thinking, stop. I'll make all of you stop. Thank you. Wow, Jim, and thank you so much. You know, I realize we've known each other for so many years, but I've never heard you read live before, and that was just riveting. My goodness. Oh, thanks, yeah. Well, thank you both so much for those readings. Um, let's just dive right into some questions. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, fiction and nonfiction, because I know you've both written in, in both of those genres before. I'm curious to know how you decide what stories to tell through a fictional lens versus what you choose to write as an essay. Um, Anjali, would you mind if we started with you? Not at all. Thank you for that wonderful question. Um, so that is always a tough choice for me, but what it comes down to for me, because I should say at the outset that I, I love all kinds of writing, but memoir and personal essays are sort of my, my heart. They're, they're my, it's my instinct to write nonfiction, to write essays. Even though I tend to read more fiction, I tend to write more nonfiction. But what it comes down to for me is that at the end of the day, um, I sometimes get bored being in my own head and I get bored being the primary vehicle for telling a story. <laughs> and so the desire to tell the story from other points of view, um, you know, overwhelms me. I mean, obviously this book takes place over 70 days. I wasn't even alive, uh, you know, during uh, a big chunk of the years that this book covers. Um, so it allows me to really go into other characters' heads when I write fiction um, and, and allows me to sort of see a problem or an issue from several different angles instead of having information always filtered through my perspective. Um, and so at the end of the day, that's what it comes down from me. Do I really want to talk about this political turmoil, again, from my point of view in a personal essay or memoir type writing? Or do I really want to sort of take a look at this issue from multiple different points of view, from multiple different characters who have different ethnicities and religions and ages? Um, and so that ends up being sort of the factor that, that uh, makes or breaks whether or not I'm writing fiction or nonfiction. Great. Thank you so much. Jimin, what about you? Um, so that was great. I loved your answer, Anjali. I, I think that, um, I think it has to do with a question. That's what always starts anything that I write. Like I'm just, with a small revolution, I went to Korea in 1985 and I didn't understand what was happening. And, um, and I, I think it's all about context. And so um, 
I wanted to write a book that gave me the opportunity to look deeply um, at this question about what was happening in this country in, in Korea in 1985 in South Korea, and also what had happened um, with North Korea. And so the character that my main character is, is speaking to um, wants to unify the country. And he's even taken the pro-democracy movement even further to try to unify the country with North Korea. And so it, the book, the project of the book gave me an opportunity to learn all the, the different sides um, to that question. In terms of trying to understand, um, trying to figure out whether I'm gonna write it as a, an essay or a memoir or nonfiction versus fiction is, um, so I grew up in um, a family where I was really told to be careful about everything that I said. It was, um, it was a community where I felt like I was in a fishbowl. My father was um, a very well-respected internist in town. And I think that when I write nonfiction, I am always worried about what people will think. And I have to go, like when I've written my short pieces, I've had to go and, and check with my family, my cousins, did it really happen this way? How did you feel about this and that? And it's fun, I, I get to get all kinds of details. Um, like in this piece I wrote about the movie Minari, I got to talk to my cousins and say, was it really like this for you? What, did this happen this way? And with fiction, I'm free to make stuff up and explore things. Um, I have two brothers. I don't give Yuna any brothers. You know, it, it ends up being kind of a fun way for me to not be responsible for some of the dynamics. Cer certainly have to be responsible for the things that happened, um, but it frees me up from some of the constraints that I'm always trying to get rid of um, having grown up that way and being Korean American, you know, in this country in a way. Thank you, Jimin. So here's another question for both of you. Um, you know, you've talked about sort of your own experiences as individuals and then fictionalizing some parts of um, real life experiences. How do you edit out? How do you edit in? How do you decide what to include and what to build on as a fiction? And how do you responsibly sort of edit out the real parts of history um, that you feel like perhaps the story might not need or might overwhelm the story? Does that make sense as a question? Anjali, how about you first? Um, that absolutely makes sense. And in fact, it very much alludes to my own process writing the book. Um, so the character that I most resemble is the character of Sean. Um, she's in her early forties for most of the book and she's biracial. Her mother is white, her father is uh, Indian. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, she's not really connected at all to her Indian heritage because her father abandoned their family when she was five to move to India on the other side of the world. And then he ended up passing away when she was 11. Um, and so what Sean does as a character is address all of the issues that I have felt um, that I encounter as someone of mixed race. Um, my father is an Indian immigrant and my mother is half Puerto Rican and half Austrian. Um, I grew up with um, almost all of my Indian relatives living abroad. Um, later in life, when I was an adult, one of my cousins came to the US, but pretty much everyone is either in India or now Australia and Singapore and uh, the Netherlands. So, um, so I've always, tried to figure out growing up, how do you carry all of your various identities and, and the challenges of that, right? Of carrying on my, my Austrian grandmother's uh, Austrian traditions and the Puerto Rican uh, Spanish rice and beans recipe. And then of course my, uh, my father's culture. And so um, the dilemma that I wanted to look at was um, what are the risks and the challenges of being either mixed race or mixed ethnicity or mixed uh, or from a multi-faith home, what have you. Um, 
And I've been very lucky in that I've had fairly close relationships with many of my uh, grandparents and I've met some of my great grandparents years ago. Um, but I still find that challenge. Um, so Sean is sort of the more unfortunate uh, mixed race person in that she loses a lot when she's young. And so she does not have the ties to her ancestral lines um, that I do. Um, so even though she is loosely based on me, I sort of make, I make the bigger conflict in her life that she's disconnected, that she in fact is not inheriting any of her heritage and her culture, um, and that she doesn't even know her Indian family members. Um, so I sort of started with my life, but then took it to a different extreme, which is, you know, what if you truly don't know your family history? That's not what I'm going through uh, as a mixed race person, but I did make it central to her character. And so even though she started out with me as a reference, um, I then ended up completely going in a, a very different direction with her to tell the story. Thank you, Anjali. Jimin, what about you? Yep, that, that's a great question. I, um, it, this is, it's the reason why it took me so long to write this book. There are so many different drafts of this. Um, I didn't know what to include and what didn't, what, what not to include. I, I researched so much and I think it took me 20 years really to get it into this shape. And um, I, I mean, I wasn't working every day all those years, but it's interesting because it's fairly new still. I mean, 1985, I know it's not new now in 2021, but I think that there was a lot of information. It takes time for, for information to come out. So, um, so for example, the Guangzhou Diary, which was published back in I think, 1991, thereabouts, um, it really chronicled what had happened in 1980 in Korea. That really was that um, it, it, it started to intensify the, uh, the feeling that people had that the government um, was not treating them fairly, that they needed more equity, that there was, um, it, it, it really fueled um, a lot of even the, the international interest once word got out. So it took a lot of time and I think that um, even when I started writing this before this was published, some of that wasn't, that information wasn't readily available. Um, the Guangzhou Diary, the, the way that it was, it was published it had to be published under a pseudonym. It was reissued just recently, but um, there was a lot of pressure, a lot of suppression of information. So, um, but back to your question, I think that um, having this segmented fiction form allowed um, me to distill what was essential in some ways and, um, and allowed me to incorporate the confusion um, so that what was really important could kind of rise to the surface for that moment for her um, in terms of these choices. Um, by having this hostage crisis, um, it made the main character try to figure out what had happened, and my, one of my big things is about responsibility. What, what had she done? What can people do in general? Um, we've gone through this now with this former president. Um, there was much more activism than ever before. And um, I think there's a lot in there about individual responsibility and essentially that, and then collective responsibility, it, it's what ended up helping me decide how to, like how much history to include, um, how to shape this book, ultimately. Thank you, Jimin. Well, we only have about three minutes left together. So of course I'm going to throw like a huge question at both of you. Um, it's kind of open-ended, but I think it's really significant. Um, what does it take to tell the whole story? Um, one that, feels honest and true to the issues and ideas, but is still a compelling work of fiction. Anjali. Wow, that is that is a big question, <laughs> Thank you for asking. 
seeing it though. So what does it take to tell the story? Well, I think the only way for me to answer that is to talk a little bit about my process, um, which was when I sat down and realized I was gonna be looking at 70 years of a story, that felt really overwhelming. I mean, we have many authors, uh, who have done stories over several generations, over several hundred years. It's not that it can't be done, but it's very, very tricky. Um, so for me, what I ended up doing was writing many more pages than what you see in this finished book and writing in several more decades and several more characters' points of view. And then after I took that entire story, whittling it down from there by asking myself the question, what will it take to have a reunion happen between the two characters of Deepa, the granddaughter, the grandmother, and her granddaughter, Sean? Um, they are estranged. They have been estranged for over 30 years. What will it take to get them together? So then when I asked myself that question, many of the chapters and the scenes of the book that I had before fell away because I knew that I was trying to link two characters together. I knew that it would take several secondary characters in the book to do so. Um, but then anything else wasn't really essential to the telling of this story. Um, and so for me, it was very much about overwriting the book, like writing more and more pages and then really, you know, taking scissors to it and chopping it down to the essential um, reunion that uh, is at the heart of the novel. It's not really a spoiler to say it's a reunion because it's not the kind of reunion that writers will expect. Um, but, um, but yeah, I had to, it, it was a matter of revision, of deletion, of, as they say, killing your darlings in order to find out what would be the primary narrative thread in the book. Fabulous. And Jim, in our last minute to you. Um, I, I will say that um, I think, you know, we're all struggling to tell our stories, um, the whole story, the true story, what's real to us. And I'm always excited when I see people, um, they, when they find, I mean, we always call it like your voice or something, but really it's, it's, it's kind of finding, figuring out the things that you've been taught so you can make that work um, for you. And I think that there's so much about, um, okay, I know we don't have much time. So why don't I, I just do this, All right? This is Matt's new book. Um, and the reason why I'm pointing to this, I know Anjali loves it and Jungians, is because um, I, I feel like, as a Korean American, and, and for all of us, as we're trying to find new ways to tell stories, to tell the whole story, whatever that is, we, we have to sort of find a way through to finding what's real and true for us. And there are so many things out there that tell you, this is how you should write a story, and this is what you need to include, and this is not right, or whatever it is, and why you're doing it. And I think that the book is really, Matt's book is really great at helping you figure out what is true for you? What is the context in which you were taught things so that we can all be much more um, able to find our way through that and find what's authentic and genuine and also um, gives makes us excited to write and tell our stories, which I want everyone to do. I think that's a perfect ending point. The book that Jimin is holding up is by Matt Celestis. It's called Craft in the Real World. And I think all three of us um, are in high agreement that it, it's absolutely worth reading and, and carrying forward in one's work. Terrific. It's been a fast but wonderful conversation. Thank you both so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank, Thank you, you so much. This is really fun. Thanks so much. For everyone watching, please stay with us for our next program, which is called Why a Photo Tells a Thousand Words. Thank you.